The rest of us, let's take our Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I, uh, I, I enjoy, I guess, I, I use the word art. I, I enjoy good art. Um, last uh, weekend, uh, Jonathan play at the uh, Old Stone Fort. And uh, it was kind of neat because he actually displayed a, a picture, a painting, that uh, he had used Robin as the kind of the model uh, for the key, uh, key character, I guess, in it. It was the, uh, the uh, story of a, of a teacher who led her children through a blizzard to safety. And uh, so we went in there, and he had that, and he had a couple of other historic pieces. And I, I always enjoy looking at good art. Um, last, uh, when I was down in Pensacola, uh, last week, a uh, week before, uh, I, um, Robin and Brennan and I went downtown. I, I, in all the years I went to college, I think I was down, I think maybe twice or three times uh, in four years there. And um, so I went downtown. It was kind of neat. I got to see the jewelry store is actually still there that I got my wife's engagement ring in. It's still there. I walked in and I said, hey, I just wanted to come in. Hasn't changed a whole lot. And the girl says, well, anything I can help you with? And I told her what I was there for. She said, oh, that's really neat. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, I said, the ring worked pretty good. I've kept her for 31 years. So she kind of looked at me like, okay. <laughs> but right up the corner from that, there is, there was, there was uh, an art gallery. It's a gallery that a local artist come in. And, and, and I will, I'll be honest with you. I'll be really, really honest. What some people call art, I don't. Uh, uh, some of the things, there was a, there, they had a, um, a radio tower, you know, these, those tripod, like these things. They had one of them laid on its side, and they had tinsel draped across it. And that was an art display. And I thought, okay, whatever. But years ago, there was a, a, uh, a challenge. And they said, they, they told these artists, we want you, the theme, we want you to, to paint pictures on this theme. Peace. We want you to paint a picture about peace. Well, the time, the artists brought their pictures in and set them up. And some of them were obviously tremendous works of art. But when they, when they unveiled who had won the first, second, and third place ribbons, it was kind of very interesting. The third place ribbon showed the picture of a mother cradling her sleeping baby. The second place prize was the picture of a sailboat out in the middle of a lake that was just like glass, no wind blowing whatsoever. The third was the picture of a terrible storm in nature. The trees were bent over, the rain was falling, you could see lightning in the background. And people didn't understand why it had won first place. They said the theme was peace. Well, the judges came over and people were saying, why, 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 why? I don't understand. Why is this picture the one that won for peace? And the judge pointed to the middle of the painting, and in the middle of the painting was a rock, a rocky crag. And tucked into that rocky crag was a little bird. And the bird was asleep. The bird was asleep in the midst of a storm. That was what the judges deemed as the most worthy of first prize about peace. Folks, our world's in turmoil right now. I mean, our, our world's, a just, just, just our nation. Forget about the rest of the world, just our nation. We can even take it down, just down to our state, just to our area. Well, I want to ask you this morning, in the midst of all of this turmoil, all that's going on, do you have peace? Do you truly have peace? Helen Keller said, I don't want peace that passes understanding. I want understanding that brings peace. 
Galatians chapter 5, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We've talked about love, the love of God. We've talked about joy. But the third thing you find in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and what's the next thing? Peace. My question again is, do you have peace? It is interesting to note that the word peace is found in every single New Testament book save one. First John does not use the word peace, though the concept of peace is definitely there. Now it's interesting too that the Jews have a very unique way of handling the word peace because the word peace to them, see, for us, when we think of peace, we, uh, we think of really kind of one thing. Not the Jews. The Jews have a very unique word that they use in their language. It's the word shalom. The word shalom can mean multiplicities of things. When you greet somebody, you say to them, shalom. When you depart from them, you say, shalom. What you're saying is, may the peace of God overshadow you. May the peace, of, for instance, if you're greeting one another, shalom, may the peace of God overshadow what we have together. You're leaving me, shalom, may the peace of God overshadow you as we apart from one another. Peace. Do you have peace? Now the Bible talks about three elements to peace. First of all, there's the peace with God. Second the peace of God, and third of all, there's the peace from God. Now, I'm going to give them a little different terminology here in just a second. So, now, I would like you to take your Bibles, though, and go to the book of Philippians chapter 4. I hope you don't mind using your Bibles in church. Philippians chapter 4, and I want you to look at what he says here. There, there's a word here. Actually, a phrase, not necessarily a word. We're going to go to, to verse 5 to start with. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. It says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. By the way, aren't you glad the Lord's at hand? Okay, let me try that again. Aren't you glad the Lord's at hand? Because uh, I can tell you this. It's no matter how bad it looks right now. Remember something, folks. If you're saved, this is as bad as it gets. This is as bad as it gets. Now, if you're not saved, this is as good as it gets. But if you're saved, this is as bad as it gets. Now, notice what he says then down in verse 6. Be careful for nothing. How many of you, you know that word careful? My, my family and I have a joke in our household about something. We always, say, we always say the word careful after somebody's been hurt. You stub your toe. Ow! Oh, careful! You know, we, 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 we look at each other and go, you should have said something to me before I hit my toe. Be careful. We think of the word be careful. We, we almost have this idea that careful is kind of working around a, a problem, working around a, a hurt or a potential problem. But that is not the Bible definition of care or careful. Here in, in Philippians chapter 4, when it says be careful for nothing, it's literally saying... Don't be filled with care. Careful, full of care. Now, chances are, many of you came in here this morning, and you've got problems. Some of you, the problems are in your own life. Maybe it's a physical problem. Maybe it's a financial problem. Maybe it's, you know, some other personal problem. Maybe it's the care for somebody else, family member, loved one, friend. You walked in here, and if, if really we could see the burden that you're bearing this morning, you'd be like this. Now, here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, I don't want you to be so overwrought with care that you can't function. God wants to give us peace. Now, the first peace, or the first element of this peace. And I will tell you this, without this first element of peace, you cannot have the others. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the words. First of all, there's eternal peace. Then there's internal peace. And then there's external peace. Internal peace, or excuse me, eternal peace is where we need to start. If you have your Bibles, turn back to the book of Isaiah chapter 53. 
You don't have to answer me out loud. But does anybody have problems here? Now, I will tell you this. If you don't have a problem, no worries. One's probably coming. Aren't you encouraged by that? <laughs> Look at Isaiah chapter 53. I love Isaiah 53 because I can imagine as Isaiah is penning. Of course, let me ask you. Y'all can answer me out loud. Who's Isaiah 53 talking about? Jesus Christ. But you know what? As Isaiah is penning these words down, I can only imagine what's going through Isaiah's mind. I wonder what this is about. Who is he talking about? Because you got to remember, Isaiah, if you don't know this, Isaiah was written before Jesus came to earth. Isaiah 53 is a prophetic chapter that tells about Jesus Christ, God's Son, coming to this earth, living, dying, and giving his life for us. As Isaiah is writing this down, I'm sure there was a part of him that's going, what is, what is, what is God telling me here? Notice to you what he says in verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, speaking of Jesus, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. By the way, that the we there is talking about the Jews. It's Isaiah, recognize, he didn't recognize this at the time, but it was the Jewish people not even recognizing who Jesus was. And by the way, even to this day, many Jewish people still don't recognize who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is God's Son. He's the Savior of mankind. And by the way, He wants to save the Jewish people too. He wants to save them. But they didn't recognize that. They, they didn't have a desire for Him. Notice what He says in verse 3 though. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of what? Sorrows. And acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our, what? And carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our, what? Was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. You know what he's saying here? He's saying that God wants to take the burdens, the sorrows, the, 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 the sufferings that we go through. He wants to take them on himself in Jesus Christ and give to us peace. But how does that peace come? Well, go back to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. How do we get peace? Now, now here's the thing. Let, let me just tell you this right up front. I think a lot of people have this mindset that if I didn't have problems in my life, life would be good. Some of y'all are looking at me like a deer in headlights. I can tell even though I can't see you. How many of you would say, well, you know what? If I didn't have problems in my life, life would be good. Y'all do know what happens to a place that only has sunny days. You have to understand something, folks. It's not the sunny days alone that make plants grow. It's the rain. It's the difficult days that help make our lives. So the peace we're talking about here, see, we have this idea that somehow if God gives us peace, then that means all of our problems will go away. That's not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is this, I want you to, first of all, I want you to have peace, but I want you to have peace with God, an eternal peace. Look, if you would, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and come short of what? Can I, can I tell you, here's our problem. Many of us don't realize this, but before we get saved, we're at odds with God. You understand that? Do you understand that before you get saved, you are at odds with God? God and you are not getting along. Okay? Um, some of y'all heard me talk about it. I had an, I had an arch nemesis in, in school. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but, but the fact of the matter was is he and I never got along. We, you know, if he, said it was, if he said it was light, I said it was dark. If he said it was hot, I said it was cold. I, wouldn't, I would never admit to him that he was right. Anybody ever known somebody like that in your life? Anybody have somebody like that? No matter what they say, you're going to say the opposite. No matter what you say, they're going to say the opposite. 
You're at end. That's, by the way, that's what the word enmity, when the Bible uses the word enmity, that's what it means. When he does something, you do the exact opposite. Enmity with God. Now, understand something, folks. Some of us say, well, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an enemy of God. Really? He's holy and you're not. He's holy and we're not. I'll put myself in there. He's righteous. He always, folks, God always does the right thing. I'm going to say it again. God always does the right thing. He always does. Now, let me ask you, how, how, is it, how often do you always do the right thing? That's kind of an oxymoron. How often do you always do the right thing? We don't. You know what? I, I'm, 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 lucky. I'm lucky to get it right half the time. God always gets it right. We're sinners. Every single one of us in this room is a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 53 when he says, look, we're at odds with God. We don't have peace with God. Folks, if we die without Christ, we're separated from him. We're at odds with God. See, our lives are lived literally in defiance against God. Go back, if you would, to the book of Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 1. And I know, I've, if you're a visitor today, you say, well, he uses the Bible a lot. If you don't, if, if you don't catch, keep up, that's okay. I'm going to read the verses when we get there, so don't feel bad. But I want you to know what the Bible says, not what just some preacher came up with. Colossians, chapter 1. Notice what it says down in verse, oh, let's go down to verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, that's in Jesus, should all fullness dwell, and having made, see the next word? Made what? Peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. See, what happens is, is when we get saved, we stop that moment of defiance. We trust Christ as our Savior, and we let him do the redemptive work. Now, what does he do? He reconciles us. Now, reconcile means to be made at peace with. We were living in defiance against God. Jesus Christ dies on the cross. We trust him as our Savior and let him do the redemptive work. And when that happens, our defiance ends and reconciliation takes place. Now, take your Bibles and go back to John chapter 14. We're talking about eternal peace. Eternal peace. I, I, I would love to be able to tell you, I don't have time this morning, of all the individuals, and, and you all have heard me use this as a reference point, we live in a day that when a person is, is, is dying, we give them medications so that they don't suffer. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. I'll be real honest with you, I don't like pain. I don't like pain. Matter of fact, I got up this morning, I, I kind of slept on, on my neck a little bit wrong, and I've had a, kind of a crimp in my neck all morning long. And so uh, right after, right before Sunday school, I said to my wife, I said, do you have any ibuprofen? And she said, yes. Yeah. So she got it, and then I took a couple of ibuprofen. And, the, the, and it's numbed down the pain a little bit, but if I go like this, it's because I'm trying to keep stretch my neck out because I feel like my neck's about ready to pop. Don't, don't feel bad for me. It's just, you know, i got to get a better pillow or something. I don't know what it is. I don't like pain. I'm a wimp. Thank you. <laughs> I don't like pain. So if somebody is dying, we give them medication. But you understand something? Years ago, we didn't do that. Years ago, people died. And through their suffering, we saw what was really in their heart. Because you know what suffering does? It squeezes the juice out of your heart. It does. It squeezes the juice out of your heart. And if you're a bitter person, or if you're a... I, again, I almost brought lemons today because I thought this would be a perfect one for this because of this illustration. If you've got lemon juice, if you will, bitterness in your heart, you know what suffering does? It squeezes that lemon juice out. And what happens? You're a bitter, angry, dying person. But if you've got the peace of God that passes all understanding and suffering comes, squeezes your heart, 
sweetness comes out. See, look if you would here in John chapter 14, or excuse me, John chapter 14, look at verse 27, for sake of time, Jesus says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be, what? You know, and can I ask you a question? How much peace did Jesus Christ have? He had so much peace that when the boat was rocking and sh from the storm, what was he doing? He was asleep. When he knew that they were coming to get him, to take him and nail him to a cross, what did he do? He prayed for others. That's the kind of peace he wants to give. It's an eternal peace. Second of all, there is an internal peace. If you have your Bibles, go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Internal peace. My wife, and she's not in here now. She's down with Junior Church. Um, my wife gets so frustrated at me because usually when I get into bed, I'm asleep in less than five minutes. Is there anybody else who's ever faced that with a spouse? I'm asleep in five minutes. She's over there. She tells me, because I'm asleep. I don't know. She says, for 40, 45 minutes, she's over there. And it's compounded, because she can't get to sleep. You know why it's compounded? I'm over asleep. Now, I, I will tell you one thing you should never say. I did it once. I said, well, I, was, I thought I was being funny. I said, well, maybe it's because I have a clean conscience. Yeah, it was exactly. I was, it, it was meant as a joke. It did not go over well then either. I got a question. Do you have internal peace? So you say, well, I'm saved, preacher. Good. I'm glad you've got, you've got peace with God. But I'm not asking, do you just have peace with God? I'm asking, do you have the peace of God? The kind of peace that when you pillow your head, and I'm not picking on what I just said a minute ago, but when you pillow your head at night, are, do you have the peace of God? to such a degree in your heart and in your life that you're not flipping and flopping and turning because you're so worried and stressed out about everything that's going to go on. See, there's the peace with God, but there's the peace of God. Now, I want to point this out to you. The peace of God is something that our circumstances cannot take away. Look at Romans chapter 8. And again, you know, some of you know this verse well. And we know that all things do what? Okay, come on, help me out. Romans chapter 8, verse 20, and we know that all things what? And work together for what? You see, we always stop. All things work together. We need to finish it. We, all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. By the way, isn't it wonderful to know what God's expecting of you? It's a wonderful thing to know what God's expecting from you. Some people sit back, oh, I just wish I knew what God would tell me what he wants me to do. You understand, folks, God is not trying to hide his will from you. Now, the devil wants to hide God's will from you, but God doesn't want to hide his will from you. Amber, again, not here. She's actually down in Pennsylvania. So I can do this when she's not here. She was dating a guy, sharp guy, really, really sharp guy. She called up one day and said, Dad, I, I just don't feel peace about this. And I said, sweetheart, I'm going to ask you a question. How long have you felt this way? She said, kind of from the first day. But she said, I thought it was me. Because, Dad, you know him. He is a sharp guy, and he is. Still is. He's actually an assistant pastor of a church out, in, out west now. Engaged to a friend of Amber's. And it's okay. It's okay because you know what? We figured out, she figured out something. He wasn't God's will for her life. 
And that's okay. Look, I'd rather have my children wait and be in God's will than hurry and be out of God's will. I say all that because I want you to understand something. All things work together for good. And there's a peace, the peace of God. God wants, see, it's not, it's not something that the circumstances of life, that's what he's referencing here. Look, if, if, you're, if the circumstances of your life are taking your peace away, then where are you getting your peace from? Think about it. If the circumstances are robbing you of your joy, then where were you getting your joy in the first place? If the circumstances of life are robbing you of your love for God or your love for others, where was your source of love? Look, I said this in, in, in something in, in this morning in, in prayer time, and it just really stuck with me. Folks, the circumstances of our life ought not run us. The circumstances of our life ought not run us. If the circumstances of your life and my life are running us, whether they're running our peace or they're running our joy, then that's the source of our joy. That's the source of our peace. The reason that many of us struggle with joy and peace is because we've been getting it from the wrong fountain. The world can't give you joy that passes all understanding. The world can't give you a peace that cannot be taken away. The world's peace will be taken away when the wrong guy is in the White House, our peace is taken away. When the wrong guy is in that place or this place, if that's when our peace is taken away, then we were looking to the wrong person for our peace. The circumstances ought never take our peace away. And if it is, you've been looking in the wrong place. See, it's internal peace. Go back to Philippians chapter 4. You see, the circumstances can't take away God's peace. But second of all, the culture that we live in can't take away God's peace. Look at Philippians chapter 4. I stopped with verse 6, but let me point out verse 7. It says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep what? And, and not only your hearts, but your what? And minds through Christ Jesus. Who's he talking to? He's talking to a group of believers in Philippi. There's one word I want you to notice in Philippians 4, 7. You see, it, 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 it says right there in verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall, four letters, what's the next word? Okay, a keep. A keep is a guard. It's someone who's guarding. It's the, it's the concept of, for instance, we have every service, some of y'all don't know this, some of you do because you had to walk through them. Unfortunately, in our day, we have to, as a church, protect ourselves. So once service starts, all the doors get locked in this building. You're locked in. Give me five bucks and I'll let you out. No, I was kidding. <laughs> You're locked in. We locked the door. Doors are shut, locked. There's a guy at that door right now. Guy at that door right now. You know what he's there for? To keep. Keep you. To keep you safe. He's there every service. They take kind of take turns. Certain people take obviously do that particular job a little bit more often. But they're there to be a keep. That's the same word that's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. Notice what it says keeps our hearts. The peace of God. See, I, I'm one of those firm believers that, that when all of it, if all of a sudden you start losing the peace in your heart, there's something not right in your spiritual walk. See, when, when you start losing that peace, that means that something has crept in that needs to be dealt with. See, peace is not based in circumstances. It's not based in our culture. It's 
based on our relationship with God. That's how you can have men like Paul and Silas when they were in the jail at Philippi, singing praises unto God while their feet are in stocks and their backs have been bloodied by a whip, and yet they can praise God. Why? Because they have peace of God. They have the peace of God. They have peace with God, but they also have the peace of God. Internal peace. One last one. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Is anybody else starting to get warm in here but me? The furnace is working well. Yeah, but if it turns into a puddle. Uh. Eternal peace, internal peace, number three, external peace. Now I'm going to make this real practical. Look if you would here in Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to notice something here. He says, he's talking about the idea of, well, let's just read it. Verse 21. He says, you have, been, it, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever, shall, uh, who, uh, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother Rika shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, because of this, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Now, what is he saying this? He's saying, you need to be at peace with others. Look, if, 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 you're, if there's people that you're not getting along with, understand something, it may not all be their fault. Let's just be honest, okay? You're in church. By the way, even when you're not in church, God's still with you. Since you were in church, let's, we're here for a focal point, and let's, let's let the focal point be the truth of God's word. You know what's possible if that person you're not getting along with, that part of, the, part of the reason you're not getting along with it may be your fault? You ever thought about that? I know it's a novel idea to take responsibility for your own actions. I'm being facetious. But that's literally what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, look. Now, and note, by the way, notice where the unforgiveness and the bitter spirit can lead to. Look at verse 21. Where can it lead? Well, yeah, it can lead to judgment. But, but, where, but that judgment comes because what have you done? You've murdered somebody. You've murdered somebody. You've got that bitterness has crept into your heart. Now, I know that, that unfortunately we are living in a society and a culture. I was, was reading something the other day that um, I think it's somewhere out, was it out in Washington or Oregon someplace, that, there, that there's four or five, or maybe, no, San Francisco. They, they have found that there were four or five homeless men that were just murdered. They're just murdered. And, and they... To this point, they have no idea of motive. Do you, do you know that's where our culture is heading? That life has been so marginalized. Why should we be, why should we be surprised we've been killing a million and a half babies every year? Why should we be shocked? We're, tell, we're telling the kids, look, you're nothing but a primordial burp. That's all you are. That's called evolution. That's what I meant by primordial burp. Of course, they can't tell you where the matter came from, the energy came from, but that doesn't matter to them. <laughs> Folks, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that child in the womb, that is a precious gift from God. And understand something. To take a person's life, it takes a special wicked person. And what's sad is there are people that are in the medical profession that have studied for years watching the fragility of life and because of the hardness of their heart, they'll go into the womb and rip a baby out of the womb. But these homeless individuals were killed. They don't even know the motivation behind it. Do you know that's kind of the exception to the rule? Do you know that most people, when they murder somebody, they meant to? because they were angry at them or they hated them for some reason? 
That's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the progression. He's saying, he's saying that if you don't forgive, if you're not being forgiven, that can be the seed of a bitterness that can lead to anger, that can lead to hatred, that can lead to murder. Isn't it amazing how when you get bitter and angry in your heart, the things you're, you're willing to do, when you get bitter and angry, oh, I would never, you ever gotten so mad that you said something that you never would have said any other time? Because when the peace isn't there, see, there's an external peace. Go back to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And look, if you would, down at verse 14. Understand, folks, peace, is, peace with other men, other people, doesn't just happen. Okay? You have to work at it. Look what he says in Psalm 34, 14. He says, depart from evil and do good. Look at the next two words. Seek peace. And then he says, and do what? Pursue it. In other words, intentionally go after it. Look, if you're having problems in your home, listen to me, they don't just go away. If you're having problems in your marriage, they don't just go away, folks. If there's problems between you and your kids or your parents, they don't just go away. They don't just go away. You don't just wake up one morning and go, oh, look, everything's good. You got problems at work, they don't just go away. With your neighbors, they don't just go away. See, there has to be an intentional seeking for this external peace. That's what David is writing here. He's saying, look, you want to have peace? Great. Now you need to look for it. You need to pursue it. You need to intentionally say, I want it to be a part of my life. Well, how do we do that? Well, let's, let's look at a couple really quickly, and we'll be done. Look at Proverbs 10. How many of you have ever had problems with somebody? Okay, let's try that again in English. Everybody in here has. But can I tell you why the problem continues? The problem continues many times because we attack the person and not the problem. We attack the person, not the problem. Look at Proverbs 10.10. 10. Actually, let's go back up to verse 9. Solomon writing, he says, He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. He that winketh with the eye causeth sorrow, but a pratting fool shall fall. In other words, a pratting fool is somebody who doesn't try to resolve the conflict, they use the conflict to attack an individual. Okay? This sounds like I'm being political, and I'm not. It has annoyed me to no end. And look, I'm not here to defend Donald Trump. You've heard me say enough things, that are things about him that I don't agree with. But here's the thing is, the man can't do anything right in some people's eyes. His wife wears a pair of shoes, they attack her. She wears a jacket, they attack her. She changes the shoes, they attack her for changing the shoes. It doesn't make any difference what the man does, they hate him. And they're going to do everything they can to destroy him. Now, by the way, I'm not saying, look, I've said enough, the fact of the matter was, by the way, he's not a preacher. Yeah, he's not a preacher. But my point is this. I don't think in some people's mind, no matter, if he were, if he were to, to bring peace in the Middle East, they would still find fault with it. Yeah. I found a cure for cancer. Yeah, right. I, look, here's 20 people. They got cured. Yeah, right. They're going to blame him. No, you know what that is? That's called a pratting fool. That's what a pratting fool is. Somebody who does not, somebody who takes an individual and they keep attacking the person. They take what that person has done and they use it as a weapon against them. That's what a prating fool is. Okay? 
Do you understand you're never going to resolve a problem if you do that? There's never going to be resolution. By the way, that's not just in government. That's in our homes. Husbands and wives, if you're arguing with each other, attacking each other doesn't resolve the problem. And you know what the Bible calls you? A pratting fool. So sip on that one and swallow hard. The point of the matter is this. Look, if you want to have peace, it starts with you saying, you know what, I'm going to resolve the problem. I'm not going to attack the person. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This is just trying to be very practical. And look, if you would, down at verse 13. Ephesians 4, 13. He says, till we all come in the what? in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Then skip down to verse 29. He says, But let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. In other words, find a way to resolve the problem. Find a way to resolve the difference. Look, I, I believe with all of my heart that one of the reasons why we have so many conflicts, whether it's in government, whether it's in families, whether it's in business, is because the people that are involved in that, first of all, don't have the peace of God. They don't have peace with God. They don't have the peace of God, and they don't have peace from God. They don't have peace from God. Well, as I close, I want you to take your Bibles and turn back to John chapter 16. God's talking about wanting us to have peace. And he says, here's Jesus speaking in John chapter 16. Let's go back up for context to verse 29. John 16, 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things. By the way, did Jesus know all things before they recognized it? Yes. Just because they, were, they had a light bulb moment. Oh, you know everything. Jesus could have looked at him and went, and? Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee? By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. By the way, he still hadn't quite got it all straight yet. Verse 31. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Now you believe? Can, by the way, can you hear the bit of a sarcastic undertone in that? Do you believe now? Verse 32. 32. The reason I say this is a sarcastic tone, because look at verse 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered. You really don't believe it. You're just saying it because there's going to come a day in the not-too-distant future where you're going to be scattered. When did that take place? At his arrest. When he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where did his disciples go? They were like cockroaches with the light turned on. Poof. Disappeared. Every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet... I'm not alone because the Father is with me. How could Jesus... Now, let me ask you a question before we get to the, the, really the key verse in this. How could Jesus make it through the fact that he gets arrested, Peter cuts off the ear, I'm going to defend you, and then Peter denies him just hours later? How could Jesus look down from the foot of the cross? He's hanging there, nails in his hands, and nails in his feet, crown of thorns upon his head. His back is raw hamburger from the beating that he's taken. He's suffocating to death. By the way, that's how they died on the cross. They didn't bleed to death. They suffocated. Because the weight of holding their hands up would cause them to slowly suffocate. And the only way they could get their breath was to either pull themselves up on the nails or push up on the nails in their feet so they could <sighs> and 
as Jesus is going through that, he looks down at the foot of the cross. And every disciple has walked away except John. And there's John at the foot of the cross. I want you to picture this. Remember, he's suffocating to death. You want to know why he said so little on the cross? The agony that it took just to get enough breath to speak. Mother, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. How could Jesus go through all of that? Because number one, he had peace. He knew that what was going on was the purpose and plan of God. So we get to the last verse. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now listen to me. He hadn't died yet. But in his heart, he had already overcome the world. The suffering he was going through on the cross, that was just the fulfillment of what he had already prepared his heart for. He had already overcome it. You know where he overcame it? Before he came, overcame it in practice, he overcame it in his heart. You know where many of us are doing? We're letting our circumstances drive our peace. That's why we don't have any. That's why we don't have peace. Folks, you got to understand something. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And he's not going to let anything happen in your and my life that is, now listen to me, he's not going to let anything happen in our life that is going to steal his joy out of our lives. But if we're letting the situation steal joy, then it's not his peace. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So I say to you as we finish this service, Shalom. Let the peace of God go with you. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the peace with you. Thank you for the peace of you. Your peace, the peace of God. Thank you for the peace that comes from you. Lord, I pray if there's anybody that's been listening to my message, this message this morning, that does not have eternal peace with you. They don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. When they pillow their head at night, they're afraid that they will die and go into eternity lost. Lord, if there's anybody that does not know you as Savior, may today be the day that they get that eternal peace. Then, Lord, for those that know you as Savior, may they trust you. May they rest in your goodness and get that internal peace. And, Father, then may they learn to work and to work through problems and difficulties and that they would seek that external peace with others. Lord, please help us today to have the peace of God which passes all understanding, that it could keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask two questions. Number one, is there anybody who's here that would say, Preacher, I don't have eternal peace. If I died right now, I am not 100% sure that I'd go to heaven. I have doubts. I have questions. Preacher, I would like to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when this life is over with, that I would go to heaven. But preacher, as I stand here, as I sit here this morning, I have to be honest, I am not <clears throat> 100% sure that I'm on my way to heaven. I have, I have those doubts. Preacher, pray for me. I'm not 100% sure that I have peace with God this morning. I'm not sure that I'm born again, saved, and definitely on my way. I don't have that assurance. Please pray for me. With their heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody's looking. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to come to you in any way, shape, or form to intentionally embarrass you. I would never do that for the world. But if you're here this morning and say, Preacher, if I died right now, I am not 100% sure that I'd go to heaven. 
Pray for me, please. Would you just lift up your hand and take it right back down? All right. All right, let me ask you this then, Christian. Second of all, do you have peace? Not only the peace with God, but the peace of God and the peace from God. Is there anybody who would say, Preacher, you know what? I, I'll be honest. I'm saved, I know it. But I've let the troubles and trials, whether it's of my life or my circumstances, I've let it steal my peace. I've let it steal my peace. Preacher, God spoke to my heart this morning. I need to get the peace of God and the peace from God back into my life. Preacher, pray for me this morning that God would help me to have that peace that he wants to give to me. With their heads bowed, eyes closed, would you just lift up your hand and take it right back down. Lord bless you all across the room. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these folks who have acknowledged that they need that peace with you and the peace from you and the peace of God. Lord, I pray that they're struggling today, that, Lord, that you would help them to rely upon the Holy of God. Understanding to keep their hearts in mind. Lord, don't let the circumstances of our life steal our peace, steal our joy. Lord, may we live eternity conscious because there is a peace from you. Lord, I ask and pray. I, I did not recognize any hands, but, Lord, if there's anybody here that does not know you as their personal Savior, Lord, that I didn't happen to miss. If there's anybody that needs to have that assurance, may today be the day they trust you as Savior. I pray in Jesus' name. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, we do this every Sunday, so this is just because you're here. If you're a visitor, this is every Sunday. We give an invitation opportunity, and the invitation works this way. If you're here this morning and you'd like to talk with somebody, if you'd like to step out of your seat, come up to me. We'll take a place and show you from the Word of God answers to the questions you might have. Maybe it's about your salvation. Maybe it's about some other area of your life that you'd like to talk to somebody. We give you that opportunity. The second part of the invitation is for Christians to do business with God. And if you're here this morning and you need to do business with God, you're welcome to come and kneel at the front. Or if you want to stay in your seat when we stand or kneel at your seat, you're welcome to do that as well. But if there's business that needs to be done with God, we just invite you to do that business with God right now in your seat, at your seat, or up front. You do what God would have you to do this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the promise that peace can be ours. Lord, again, I pray for anybody that's been listening that does not have peace with you. Lord, please help them to get that settled first because without peace with you, there cannot be peace from you. So, Lord, help us today. If anyone needs to be saved, that today would be that day. Lord, for those that do know you as Savior, may they not take peace with you for granted. May they recognize the importance of having peace from you and the peace of God that passes all understanding. May they seek for that as David told us to do, I pray this morning in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed as the piano begins to play. If you'd like to stand together, you're welcome to stand. If you need to stay seated and do some business with God, I encourage you to do that. But let's stand together unless you're doing business with God this morning. We're not. We're going to have a long, drawn-out invitation. God is a king, not a beggar. And so you need to be respondent and responsive to him as if you were responding to the King of Kings. She's going to play one more verse. She's been playing the song by Horatio Spafford. It is with my soul. If you need the hymn book, fine. It's 375. We're going to sing just the first and last. 
and be dismissed with that. If you don't need the hymn book, maybe you just want to just keep your eyes closed and in a sense make this a prayer to the Lord. 375, if you do need the book, When peace like a river attendeth my way. When peace like a river attendeth